to four. Organization. <laughs> Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour, whether you're listening through uh, your radio on one of the 16 stations that our show is being broadcast on in 2020 through a radio app, through our website. That website's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com under the season four tab at the top of the page, studio in studio video replay or podcast replay. Thank you. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is all about you, for you, to help your garden grow better, to have healthier trees, to maintain your landscape and your yard for indoors and outdoors, as well as preserving what you grow. There are several ways in which you can get a hold of us, and you can do that via email by emailing us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or if you want to tweet us, you can do that at hashtag TWVG, or our Twitter handle is at TWVG show. You can follow us on our Facebook page, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or you can jam your fingers in the phone and give us a call anytime, 24 seven during the show, after the show, two o'clock in the morning at 1-800-927-SHOW. If you call it two o'clock in the morning, we're not going to answer. We'll, we'll address it the next business day, but the phone line is always open so we can help you with your gardening problems. Uh, we've got a big show lined up for you today. We're going to talk about the best crops that you can grow in containers in segment one. In segment two, what you need to know before, uh, before, uh, what you need to know about growing vine crops and fruit vine crops in your garden. And our guest is a very well known garden author, radio personality, Melinda Myers will be with us and we'll get to your garden questions. So let's get into the topic of segment one, Holly, and that is the best crops to grow in containers. And I guess we should preface this as saying there's some things that need to be done before you just throw a seed in a bucket or a pot. Uh, we need to talk about the size. We need to talk to right. medium. So you want to know like, um, what, what, what are you trying to grow? If you're just trying to grow some lettuce and radishes and, um, some beets, you might not need as big of a container as if you're trying to grow squash, melons, tomatoes, a dwarf tree, a dwarf tree. So you need to know the size. So like, just to give you a point of reference, you could kind of follow if you're going to do, um, five gallon buckets, which seem to be very common a lot of times for container gardeners do the five gallon bucket size and you consider that surface area one square foot, you can follow the square foot gardening method that way. So you can kind of visualize that. Yeah, five gallon bucket, a 10 gallon grow bag from rootmaker.com that you can use coupon code TWVG to save 10% off your order at checkout. Uh, another, another great one is the green stock grow tower. And if you go to green stock garden dot and use the code Wisconsin, you can save $10 on orders over 75 And those are a tower in which you can grow 40 plants or 50 plants or 60 plants in a two-square-foot area, and it works very well. The key to any the key to any container garden is drainage holes. Without drainage holes, plants are living things. Plant roots need to have oxygen, and if they don't have drainage holes and you water or it rains, it becomes a swamp and those plants suffocate and die. So we've got to have some type of drainage holes. In a grow bag from Root Maker, you don't have to worry about that because it's porous enough to where it will percolate the water through the fabric. But a bucket, you're going to have to have a hole in the bottom or the side, uh, anything like that. Uh, Green stock's got the holes already pre-made in them. So 
let's, what type of material are can we grow in? Let's uh, that that's a one, that's a question we get a lot. Is you mean like the the, the medium? Soil? Yeah, the soil. What, what can I can I just go in the backyard and dig a uh, dig a hole and and put it in my pot and put it on the porch and, and grow? No, you don't want to do that. So you want to fill it with like a raised bed mix, compost. Um, you can at the very own, least potting soil. A potting soil mix. Yep, any of those options are great options. I would if I were to do this. If I was going to grow a lot in containers, I would just get a raised bed mix. Yeah. And then I would just uh, fertilize it as needed the next year. We, would... And you can use your own compost. Oh, yeah. You can use your own compost. And we've grown a 100% compost before with no issue whatsoever. And I guess we should bring up the other container that is not technically a container, but it is straw bales. You can condition a straw bale and grow a lot of things in a straw bale. But, right. Uh, but like some... Some people might not have right. their own patio por- a patio or a yeah. balcony. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, you want to definitely think about what you're growing, and you don't want to just like, you know, Jim Bob down the street has some extra soil. You don't know what it is. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure you know what you're putting in there. Well, let's talk about some items in which can grow very well in containers, and we've grown very well in containers. And let's just start off with beets. Beets you can do nine per square foot, and we've done that very, very well in a container. Uh, it's a root crop. We find a lot of root crops do very well in containers because that loose, deep soil that that tap root can penetrate down into and develop the bulb or the carrot or whatever the, the root very, very well. One thing you don't want to you don't want to do is you don't want to grow anything that's like a perennial vegetable to, in a, container, to a certain to, level. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you've done you've been doing rhubarb. Yeah. Um, that's 100 percent your project. Mm-hmm. Um, but something like asparagus, you would not want to do. That needs to root into the to the ground. Right. Asparagus is a 20 to 30 year plant. Uh, cabbage, you can do it in a five gallon bucket, a 10 gallon grow bag. Uh, I would it, it, the larger the container in which you can physically have, whether you're on a balcony in San Diego or the backyard in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, the bigger the container, the better off you are because you're having more mass. That allows more moisture retention, slower uh, drying out of the container, even with mulch of some sort, and you can get more items in that container. Yeah, you can grow a tiny t- a tiny Tim tomato in a one gallon grow bag from Root Maker like we have very successfully, but that one gallon dr- dries out very quickly, a lot quicker than a thirty gallon does. Right. So that's something um, to definitely consider. So you can grow um, cucumber, and you would want to do two per five-gallon container or that surface area. Um, and if you're doing a vine type, not a bush, you want to add like a trellis. It doesn't have to be fancy. You can Anything. Use a, a tomato cage, something like yeah. that. Just kind of jam it into that bucket, and then you will have something for your cucumbers to grow up on. And I've had uh, porch cucumbers do very well in a very small container. Again, watering is uh, the key to all of this. Eggplants, five-gallon bucket, you can get one in those. I would I would say a, a five-gallon bucket, you could go a, a, a minimum of a three-gallon grow bag. Uh, you could squeeze it down a little tighter if you were limited on space. You could do um, green beans. So green beans are cool because they're easy. They, they're easy, yep, and they produce up until you basically kill the plant. Or the, the, the pole the beans. Yeah. The pole beans does. The, the, the bu- yeah. yeah, bush beans, four to, uh, 40 to 60 days. Uh, to reach bearing beans and then two to three weeks harvest, but they're so easy. You can it doesn't take water and put the seed in the soil and that's it. You really have no work that goes into that. Right, um, and then there's kohlrabi. So kohlrabi is a like the brassica family. It's part of the actually part of the cabbage family, but it's not a leafy vegetable. It looks like a root vegetable, but it grows above the ground. And you can do um, three uh, three plants. Uh, lettuce is very easy to do. Uh, people will say, because it's a shallow root, you don't need a deep container. However, that soil dries out very quickly. And leaf lettuce, just coat the soil uh, as thick as you can with the seeds. Make a big, thick carpet of seed and then cover it over. And then you have a thick carpet of leaf lettuce that you can harvest up to the time where it gets to the point of, of uh, bitterness and it goes to uh, seed or it, uh, it goes you know, it goes into the seed production of it. Uh, it works really well. Don't go off the one leaf lettuce plant per X amount per square foot. It just doesn't cover it with the, the, the seeds. Um, onions, you can, if you're in the correct area, you can start them from seed in a container. However, most areas, 
You want to figure out if you have a long day, short day, or neutral day geographic area based on where you're living, and you either get you know get that get the starts the live plants from your independent garden center and plant those. If you're going with just green onions, yeah, you could just plant them in the ground in the container with no issue whatever well whatsoever. Peas is another one you can direct sow. You can pre-soak your seeds. Five gallon bucket, you can grow five or six plants in a five gallon bucket, maybe a few more. Plant them about an inch diameter and then put them put a tomato cage or a trellis. Peas are one of them crops where you have to have something in order for them to grow up in order to uh, sustain their growth. Otherwise, they're so top-heavy, they will crimp the stem and they will die if they don't have something to latch on to for stability. Another thing to mention is some of these crops are seasonal in the sense like lettuce, um, radishes, and peas, and even spinach. So you could grow you know, some peas in a container for a while, then come back and plant some cucumbers or plant a tomato or some peppers so you can get more than one use out of a container. And I think the the big big ones are here are peppers and tomatoes are the two biggest ones that everybody wants to know. Can I grow them in a container? Yes, you can. How big of a container do I need for tomatoes? Five-gallon bucket, 10-gallon grow bag, uh, something of that magnitude because tomatoes need a lot of root system area. And if you get half of a whiskey barrel, you could get two tomatoes and a half of a whiskey barrel. Determinate varieties, meaning they grow to a certain height and bear their fruit, that's more of a compact for a small area. However, you're not going to have a harvest very long. An indeterminate is a vine tomato that will grow indefinitely as long as you take care of it until the frost kills it or you kill it, that you're going to have more, you need more stability, more of a cage on that. Uh, you need a cage for both of them, but you need more uh, stronger cage, I guess you would say, for the indeterminate variety because of the continuous growth that it has. Uh, so one in a, f- a five-gallon bucket, one in a 10-gallon grow bag, that's what we typically grow. Peppers, one in a five-gallon bucket. You could squeeze two in a five-gallon bucket. There's a lot of studies that have shown that peppers are a unique species in which if they grow next to one of their buddies, they seem to produce better than if they just grow isolated off by themselves. It's unique uh, on some of the studies in which uh, we're seeing on the peppers. So you could do two in a five-gallon bucket, one in a three-gallon uh, peppers, container. Peppers like to have friends. Have friends, uh, yeah. They even like to have their leaves touching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, radishes, we talked about that. You could get uh, 16 radishes in a square foot spinach. Um, So anything that you grow in a container, you have to think about what is the end result and how often do I want to water, I guess is the best way to put it. You're going to have to water regardless. If you have a drip system set up, then that eliminates that portion of the equation. However, you need to water these crops and you need to have enough soil. And with these crops, uh, real quickly, You need to fertilize them because they're in a container. The watering from rain as well as you, you're going, it's going to leach out the nutrients much more rapidly than it would if you were in a raised bed and or in the ground. So you're going to have to supplement them with an organic fertilizer of some sort periodically in order to keep the nutrients to the roots so they don't get depleted. And then you've put this effort into the plant and you got nothing. Uh, because it's depleted, it's stressed, and it's not producing what you wanted it to do uh, in, in that container. Right. So thank you for taking your time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our ninth show. Our tenth, our our tenth, tenth show. show. Yeah. Whoops. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about five good bugs and five bad bugs and farmer's markets, and we had guests um, garden trends expert Katie Dubow. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast, or we can make it even easier. You just send us an email at or to garden talk radio at gmail.com, put in um, show nine, and then we would send you that show. It's pretty easy, and we've had people ask for it, so we can do that for you. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere because I know you won't because you want to hear about how all about growing vine crops in your garden. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, preserving what you grow indoors and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. 
If you love growing tomatoes, then you've got to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim. At the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would easily like to grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, more flavor, and less bugs and disease. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes that is made with 12 natural ingredients so pure that you can feed it to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting and then sprinkle one cup around the plant after one month. That is all it takes for the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you do not have to guess what is wrong with your tomato plant because it has everything your plants need to be healthy and and produce the most delicious fruit. You'll never grow tomatoes the same again. Grow the largest, juiciest, and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Trimbin turns any turn to a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with the static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit proplugger.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Responsible watering. Accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit WaterHoop.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for staying with us. Knew you would. We're going to talk about vining fruits and vegetables. Some people don't have the space in order to grow vine crops. No, but, uh, but some people do. But some people do. And, and even if, I think that's one thing you definitely want to consider is these are going, they're vine crops, so they're going to vine out and you need to have the space for that, however that looks. And there is some times in which you may not have the space, but you're all, you're able to adapt in order to grow certain crops, for example, cucumbers. Right. You can 
build a trellis. But something like um, a pumpkin, like a regular size pumpkin, you're not going to be able to trellis that. And they do um, – Yeah, a pumpkin that's 40 or uh, 30 yeah. or 40 pounds, it's gonna, yeah, difficulty to trellis. We'll, we'll get on into all that. So first thing first with these uh, crops – you really need to just direct sow them in the ground. I, you see a lot of things online where people are starting these indoors, and we've got a couple of questions about that. Uh, what should I do? They're oversized. I'm still a couple of weeks away. You really should just direct sow them because by the time you get them hardened off to, to acclimate, uh, to get them acclimated to the outdoor temperature and plant them and be plant a seed beside them, they're caught up in about four weeks, about the same size. So, Direct sow them in the ground or in a container. Or even a straw bale. Even a straw bale mm-hmm. uh, will work for all of these. A straw bale, you, you have to condition the bale. You just can't jam seeds in it. So just for a note there. Now, another option is maybe you don't want to plant them in your regular garden or a raised bed, what have you. You can take a bag of compost. What is that, a quarter cubic foot? Well, about two cubic feet is okay. what some of those bigger ones. But oh, yeah. a foot, foot, two foot, yeah. Yeah. You put it kind of on its side. It's kind of awkward and weird, but then you cut it open. It kind of settles, and then you just plant your seeds in there. And that that's something that the uh, whatever that vine crop is will grow out of. We've gotten uh, two jack lanterns out of doing that. We've gotten three Jardel uh, uh, pumpkins out of that. Uh, works very well. Uh, if and you don't have to worry about a container because you're, that is the container uh, in which you're growing. Now let's start with the simplest one here, cucumbers. There is bush variety cucumbers, which means they grow like a, a bush, like a, uh, te- uh, like a zucchini type of plant. And then there's vine ones that will vine six to eight feet. Uh, we've always trellised our cucumbers here in, in the gardens. Uh, growing up on the farm, we never trellised cucumbers. They just sprawled across the, the garden. And it does make it much more of a difficult task in order to hunt down those cucumbers. And then you always find that one that is now the size of a football because it was hiding. And the key to cucumbers uh, in this instance is you must continue to harvest. Otherwise, when that plant matures that one fruit, that plant shuts down because its job is done by maturing the seeds in that one fruit. And it doesn't care that you were going to pick any more. It, it's done. Right. Um, so one thing we forgot to mention is that you want to think about hilling your uh, mounding these these um, viney crops. So the way you mound it is you just make a mound that's maybe three to five inches off of the normal height, whatever you, you're you using, whether it's the ground, a raised bed, a container, whatever you want to mound it a little bit. And the reason why is because they appreciate a warm uh, soil for germination. So when you mound it like that, it warms up the soil quicker with the sunlight and it also provides more surface area for the sun. And then that way you get faster germination for these crops. And then the seeds can sprawl out and go down uh, through that loose pre- soil. And- it prevents um, these uh, viney crops tend to feel waterlogged. They're more sensitive to being yes. waterlogged. So when you mound like that, it prevents that from happening. So uh, another thing, another crop that uh, we talked about, cucumbers, grapes is another one. Now, grapes is a perennial, meaning that they will last 10, 15, 20 years growing up on the farm. We still have a giant grape vine that has been there as long as I can remember, and it's on very large. There's five or six, eight, six in, um, eight-inch round fence posts mounted in concrete and thick wires that these grapes continue to grow on and produce heavily so that may not be the option for everybody but if you're getting into grapes they can be a lifelong in um, crop that you need to do some maintenance on in order to sustain the heavy production which they produce for you right so that's an option um definitely uh, you can do it on a smaller scale and continue to trim them back but but definitely something to consider is that they're a perennial and you're going to have to make that commitment if you are going to grow grapes um another one is uh pumpkins everybody wants to grow a pumpkin (laughs) it is cool growing a pumpkin like i get the appeal and it's fun and there's a lot of different varieties to grow but it does it is a commitment um it does take on the on the large scale 50 to 100 square Mm -hmm. feet for a one pumpkin plant that will produce maybe what three on a good end four on a high end right just because and i think that's the hardest thing sometimes for people to 
the hardest concept for people to grasp is that they think they're going to plant one pumpkin seed and they're going to get like 30 pumpkins. 30 pumpkins. And that's These not are true. not Jack B. Littles. These are big mm-hmm. monster pumpkins. The Jack B. Littles, you can get a dozen or so. That's the little tiny decorative ones that you get at the, the craft fair, or the, at the farmer's uh, harvest, whatever you want to call it. But we're talking about the big 10, 12, 30-pound pumpkins here. And jack-o'-lanterns are not the only type of pumpkins. There's dozens and dozens of very good, meaty pie pumpkin varieties. Uh, the jack-o'-lanterns were just, you know, that's a novelty there. Anybody can grow those for fun, but we like to grow ones that are for particular consumption purposes. Right. The biggest thing is um, when you plant these, if you get when you get well-established plants, you want to kind of uh, thin the herd, essentially. Mm-hmm. You want to thin out the weak-looking ones and then keep the the nice-looking And trim ones. back the, the vines in order to stop the outward growth and focus the development of the fruit or the or the pumpkin on the vine we've done that and it worked very well another one that a lot of people want to grow but because of their geographical area they just cannot get to grow is watermelon it's a southern plant it's a southern heat loving plant and if you really don't have 150 days of really good warm hot summer atmosphere you're really challenged to get the success of a punk of a, of a watermelon to grow in your garden. You can grow. There are some varieties that are more um, northern, northern cold yeah, tolerant. Yeah, right. But still, it is a little bit of a, a task to do so. And sometimes, like if you grow a northern variety and it takes a while, I remember that one year it was it did not taste good. No, it's just like it wasn't very sweet. It was bland. Yeah, it was very bland. So you are kind of taking a gamble, no matter. If you grow a northern variety or just a regular watermelon. And it kind of bothers me that the local seed stores just sell these melon seeds and people try to grow them and mm-hmm. they get frustrated. It's like... You're not going to grow a 50-pound watermelon in central Wisconsin, central Minnesota. The, the average gardener is not going to achieve that accomplishment on any type of any type of year whatsoever. Uh, we were able to grow a couple of years back uh, the cream of Satch- Saskatchewan watermelon. Uh, it's a little uh, – they can get 12 to 20 pounds. Ours was like a, a softball size and a yellow flesh uh, in it, thin skin. I thought it was okay. It was, we grew it out of a water, uh, of a, out of a straw bale. And that was also a year we got our first cantaloupe ever because we grew them out of straw bales. So, um, we're going to try some very unique things this year because we've got grow bags and we've got an irrigation system and we've converted our garden over. Uh, we're going to do some very different things with the, uh, likelihood of some success of growing these type of items in your garden. So, or in our garden. So be aware in your garden that you're going to need some space. Cucumbers, watermelons, pumpkins cantaloupe, honeydew, whatever. You're going to need space in order to have success. And do not just go to your garden center and go, oh, they have honeydew plant starts. Let's throw them in the garden. Be sure that you can do some research if you're in some you know, northern North Dakota or Long Island, New York, wherever. See if it's even feasible that you can potentially grow something like that in your garden because it may not be that you failed. It may be because you just can't do it because of where you live. It is warming up, and I know you want to make sure you can enjoy your yard without sharing it with beetles and grubs. With spring right here, right now, it's time for you to think about controlling those beetles and grubs in your garden and your yard. Grub Gone can be applied to turf or garden and or around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, apply with a commercial spreader, or irrigate right into the soil. Biologically, that it specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming beneficial such as bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. And it's the only non-chemical that works. Go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to talk with radio personality, TV notoriety, gardener, and author Melinda Myers will be with us. Yes, the queen of the garden, as some people has labeled her as being. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power 
power plant to do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's wegrowindoors.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it, tomatosnaps.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center is open for business. You can go purchase plants. We'll be there a little bit today. We're going to get some more plants for our garden. You can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road just off of Layton. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220. You can find them at bluemails.com. There's some protocols in which you should be aware of when you go to the greenhouse. Masks are not required. Personal uh, opinion whether you want to wear them or not. Keep your social distance from everybody and try to avoid touching multiple items. Just Pick up the plants that you are fairly certain that you're going to purchase. They've got vegetables. They've got herbs. They've got native plants. They've got decor. Everything to fit your needs to make your garden grow better. Again, bluemels.com at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton. 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in a very popular gardener that many people across the country are very familiar with. 
Nationally known gardening expert, TV radio show host, author and columnist Melinda Myers has over 30 years of horticultural experience and has written over 20 gardening books. Nationally syndicated Melissa's Garden Moment program, which airs over on 100 and 50 TV and radio stations throughout the U.S. Melinda also hosts the internationally distributed Great Courses How to Grow Anything DVD series, including the latest Food Gardening for Everyone DVD set. She appears regularly as a guest expert on national and local television and radio shows. Welcome to the program, Melinda. Thanks. It's always great to chat with you, too. Well, uh, 30 years of experience. Is there questions that you still don't have answers to? I am not. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do people come up with you, to you and you're like, I really don't know the answer to that? Oh, you bet. One of the wonderful things about gardening, whether you're doing it as a hobby or a profession, and I do both. It's what I do for a living, but it's also my passion, is I learn something new every day. New plants, new insect pests we discover, new beneficial insects, new ways of doing things, or old ways being brought back and modernized a bit. So I, I feel like I learn something new every day. Well, we, we, we're glad that we've got you on the program, to, and, and not only to enlighten Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country and all of our stations. Uh, we'll, we'll start with this. Pollinators are very important, and we notice this each year. They get more important. What are some annuals and perennial flowers that you use in your garden or would encourage people to use to attract those beneficial pollinators into your property? You know, there's so many to choose from. Um, I love annual zinnias. They're easy. You can start them from seed and get bloomed. So if you're trying to stretch your plant budget, one of my favorites is Blue Horizon Ageratum. You may know the shorter ones of floss flower Ageratum. These grow 20 inches tall, so they blend nicely with perennials. I find hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees coming to visit those flowers. Um, I love the Kufia, C-U-P-H-E-A. It attracts the hummingbirds, and I love to have pots near my window so I can watch and see them come to visit. Um, pentas, P-E-N-T-A-S, butterflies, love that one as well as the bee. The Mexican sunflower, bright orange flowers, a tall plant, so it really adds a lot of oomph to the garden. Um, Perennial-wise, boy, there's so many to choose from. Phlox is a wonderful fragrant, good for cut flowers. The hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies love it. Bee balm, as the name implies, the bees love that one. And, of course, we have our cone flowers and rudbeckias and so many different plants to choose from. And they all add beauty, so we get to enjoy their beauty while we're inviting the pollinators and supporting them because they're going to help pollinate our food crops and our flowers so that we have more flowers and a lot of our medicines come from flowers and food to eat, of course. And it's always nice to go to somebody's backyard that understands how flowers work because you're just hit with this aroma of, of fragrance. You bet. Now, with, with so many different varieties that can be grown in many different areas, why are native, native plants important to be grown no matter where you are? You know, natives have really come back into vogue. You know, it's trending and it's a very positive thing because our native plants evolved with those insects, those pollinators and birds that we're trying to attract to our garden and it helps support our gardening efforts. But like any plant, whether you're growing a cultivated or native plant, always make sure it fits in the space and the growing conditions. You know, we all have interest in growing conditions. In the city, I lived in the city on a small space for 26 years and had a huge street tree. I put in a couple smaller trees. So my garden became pretty shady over time. So I had to make sure I picked plants that could tolerate those conditions. Also, some of the natives are very aggressive. You know, if you've planted one cone flower, you'll have many. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Just be prepared. But others, like Culver's root, is a little more tame and stays put. And so trying to find the plants that really work well in your design, the space available and growing conditions is really important. And natives help give those added benefits deep roots so they create channels in our heavy clay soils. For those in heavy clay soil, as those old roots die, they add organic matter, so important in clay soils and sandy soils. They help slow water as it runs off our roofs and our patios and it catches it and it channels it down to our groundwater and along the way it cleans out some of those impurities. So not only is it good for our pollinators, it's good for the environment and it really helps us manage stormwater which is so important across the country as we've paved more areas 
and we're really getting those floods, we're getting those big downpours, followed by drought. So they can do a lot of good things for us beyond helping support pollinators. Yeah, and it helps support those pollinators, and also with those support of the pollinators, there's bad bugs that good bugs live in those native plants that control those bad bugs that we don't want in our gardens, too. You bet. A lot of the beneficial insects that we see, and sometimes they scare people, but really they're doing some good things for us, as you mentioned, controlling the bad guys. So due to this pandemic that we have all found ourselves in, many apartment condo residents will be growing vegetables in containers, sometimes, some of them for the very first time. What are some great container growing tips that you can offer all of us? You know, I was a small space gardener, as I mentioned, for probably 26 years, and I grew everything I could in containers. And I think if you've got a big enough pot and you're willing to water them and take care of them, you can grow just about anything. Fortunately, there are lots of new compact varieties now. So a couple things to start with. Pick a container with drainage holes or a self-watering pot. And the reason for the drainage holes is even if you can water perfectly, nature's going to come along and decide when it's going to water your container. So the drainage holes allow that excess water to drain. Find a quality potting mix that works for you. And they all vary, and we all have different gardening styles. So you're going to want something that holds moisture but drains well so that your plants can grow and thrive. You're going to want to fertilize properly. I'm a low-maintenance gardener, and I like to do a lot of gardening. So the more efficient I can be, the more gardening I can do. So I use a slow-release, low-nitrogen fertilizer. I apply it in the spring at planting, and then maybe if needed midsummer. But I let my garden be the guide because if it's a hot summer and I've crammed too many plants in the pot, I probably do need to fertilize midseason. If I've used a larger container and we haven't had as much rain and it hasn't been as hot, then I probably don't need that mid-season fertilizer. Those with longer seasons are definitely going to need it. So let your plants be the guide as opposed to, oh, it's time to fertilize by the calendar. So we've got it watered. We're checking daily for watering, though there's some wonderful products you can add to the soil to help extend. I'm not a fan so much of the gels. They haven't really proved to be successful, but compost, organic material, some of those things do help hold the moisture. Um, Watering thoroughly, checking daily, and water is needed, fertilizing at start using a slow release. Um, And then Grow some of those compact varieties and just do it. You're going to be amazed at the good results you get. And even the pollinators will come to your patio and balcony if you put the right flowers in your pots. What would you recommend for a type of mulch uh, with, with using containers in this uh, in this situation? You know, and that's a great point because so many people overlook mulching the soil when you do a pot. And usually you only need it right at the beginning because mulch conserves moisture, suppresses weeds, and as it breaks down, improves the soil. But usually with containers, it's a smaller amount to do and that smaller texture needed. I like to use things I find in my yard. Evergreen needles I think are very beautiful. You can also use cocoa bean shells as long as you don't have a dog that likes to eat chocolate because dog is poison. Uh, chocolate's poisonous for those dogs. I'm not the Biggest fan of stone, but stone mulch and decorative mulch is often used by others. It tends to hold the heat and cool off fast, so I tend to stick with organic mulches. Um, Sometimes a very twice shredded bark is also good. Um, As long as you keep it on the soil surface, you don't have to worry about nitrogen being tied up as well. And as soon as those plants start growing, they're going to fill in. Now, many people pack a lot of plants in their containers, so there's not much room for mulch. They're going to be watering and fertilizing more often than those of us that maybe give a little more room for the plants to grow. So our display won't be as knock your socks off at planting, but it'll catch up quickly and require a little bit less maintenance. Um, So many people think that birds can cause damage to their, to their, um, especially their edibles in their garden. Why are birds beneficial to the garden? You know, great question. I just planted my peas last weekend, and and, um, I did cover them because they do like the seeds. But songbirds, I think it's like 85% of songbirds eat insect pests. Um, Hummingbirds are pollinators, but I'll watch the hummingbirds visit my feeder, and they like to sit on my weeping lilac, and I'll watch them eat the aphids off of that and my honeysuckle vine. And so they're helping control the pests, 
I give them a little sugar water and they take care of a lot of pests for me. Other songbirds coming in are doing the same thing. And one of the nice things is we can grow a landscape that feeds them. So you don't even need to put feeders out, though you'll increase the number and diversity. But by inviting them in, maybe with a bird bath, maybe a few bird houses or plants in your landscape, you're going to bring them in and watch them devour a lot of the problem pests. Then if you are concerned, about them eating or damaging your pest. You know, I use row cover, floating row cover. It lets air, light, and water through. It keeps a lot of the insect pests, like cabbage worms, from damaging my plants, but it also protects my young seeds and seedlings from the birds. As soon as those peas are up and growing, they'll be fine, but that row cover keeps them from digging up the seeds right after planting. So there are ways we can coexist and both benefit from our landscape, feeding the birds, they eat the insects. We get to enjoy the color and motion that they provide to the garden, which I think is a real big added benefit. Well, Melinda, so much great information. We appreciate you taking time to join Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. How can our listeners find more about you? Where can they go on the on the web and, and get your books? You bet. MelindaMyers.com is my website. We are doing daily Facebook posts as well, and you can access that through my website or Melinda Myers. We're trying to get information out to people to help them, you know, projects that are affordable, that use products and seeds and plants that you probably already have in your home or can easily access. You know, I think we all have an opportunity. As you mentioned, a lot of people are starting to garden for the first time or maybe they have more time now because of the staying safer at home orders. And so we're trying to help them work out that green thumb a bit with some projects they can do good for all ages, those with and without children and just trying to keep people happy. So visit my website, melindamyers.com, and there's connections to audio and video tips, frequently asked questions, and also links to Facebook and YouTube and Pinterest and Instagram as well. Well, Melinda, thank you very much for taking time out of your day and, and sharing the information with Holly and myself and all of our listeners. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity. Everyone stay safe and happy gardening. Absolutely. Thank you. When we come back, it's all going to be about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show program dedicated to help you grow a better garden. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Grow, 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 grow. Give your plants what they need. Neptune's harvest. Grow, oh, oh. Grow, grow, grow. Hello, gardeners. It's Anne from Neptune's Harvest Organic Fertilizers in Gloucester, Mass. Neptune's Harvest shows amazing results on everything you grow. Grow, 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 grow. With Neptune's Harvest, the results will show. Show, show, show. This ain't no jive. With Neptune's Harvest, your plants will thrive. We're not kidding. Your garden will be award-winning. Neptune's Harvest is available at your local garden center or grow store. To learn more, go to NeptunesHarvest.com. Grow, grow, grow. Neptune's Harvest. Stay tuned, and you can win a gallon of Neptune's Harvest Liquid Fertilizer, a $50 value, following the commercial break. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. Dreaming of a lush green lawn and abundant garden? Not sure what products you need? Check with Chapin. From sprayers to spreaders to fertilizer injectors and greener gardening options, Chapin offers the products you need to weed and feed your lawn and garden. Feed your plants every time you water with Chapin's HydroFeed Fertilizer Injector. Weed a greener way with Chapin's Horticultural Vinegar Sprayer. Check with Chapin. Visit www.chapinmfg.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com.
Chip Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Chip Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ChipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. World's Coolest RainGauge.com. Need I say more? The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's coolest floating rain gauge. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. It's time to win another prize from Neptune's Harvest. Holly, what are the prizes in which they are going to win? This week they are offering one gallon fish and seaweed blend, one four-pound bag of crab and lobster shell, one four-ounce yet best yet biting insect spray, also one t-shirt, one hat, two koozies, and two stickers. That's a $150 value. This is open to listeners 18 years and older living in the contiguous United States. The prize will be shipped to you when it will be notified via email. And for more information, you can visit us at the com and just click on the giveaway tab to enter and all that good information. So here's how you enter. Go to your email. Type in gardentalkradio at gmail.com, subject line, enter me, context box, answer this question. What is the average length that radishes take to grow? Submit your answer at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. What is the average length that radishes take to grow? And you could be a winner. This contest ends Thursday, May 14th at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. So get your entries in now so you can be in the drawing and have a chance to win. Well, Holly, we've got a lot of questions that come in this week. So let's get to them as many as we possibly can. I apply weed and feed to my lawn. Can I compost those clippings? Uh, no, you cannot. The problem with the weed and feed is it contains, uh, unless it's an organic means, if you're using a corn gluten material, uh, that's fine. But if it has 2,4-D in it, that has an active ingredient that is a broadleaf herbicide, and it will kill your plants by um, changing the cell, uh, the, it'll kill the plants on your in your garden, the Peppers it's and the even, eggplant. Even after it's composted. Even if ever, after it's, it's composted. It's very persistent. Even years after it's composted. That's how active this ingredient is. So uh, don't do it. Uh, you're not going to be able to compost that material for your garden use. Next question. Holly, are there any varieties of nectarines that will grow in Wisconsin outside of a greenhouse? Um, there sure is. So there's the Stark Honey Glow Miniature Nectarine, and they attain. Uh, they get to a height of four to six feet. In, there's another one called Intrepid, and it's hardy in zones 4 to 7. And then there's Messina, and it's a freestone crop, which is a type of nectarine. Um, it has a sweet, large fruit with the classic look of a peach. Who knew nectarines could grow in the northern portion of the United States? Uh, I have dealt with slugs in the past. What can I do now to be proactive this year and not have to be reactive to them? Well, you can use um, this crab and lobster shell 
from Neptune's makes, Harvest. Neptune's Harvest. And it has a calcium of around 23%. Weeds help calcium, so you can they, work in Yeah, hate. They hate, hate it. Hate. What did I say? Help. <laughs> <laughs> hate calcium. So you can work in your soil for weed control. So you place it on top of the soil. Um, and because of the sharp edges, it'll keep them away. So a benefit to the slugs, it'll keep them away because of the sharp edges, but also you can, it'll work in, as controlling a weed, weed control as well. Now it's not, it's not a complete fertilizer, so you'd have to add it to your regimen of fertilizers, but it's a 530, it works really well, and uh, you can get a four pound bag, uh, from Neptune's Harvest, so you can do that. So Jenna from Long Island, New York wrote to say, I just started listening to all your segments. I live on Long Island, New York, and I love your talk show. Well, we appreciate that, Jenna. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, letting us know. And if you want to let us know where you're listening from, you can send us an email. If you have a question, you can send us an email as well at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and uh, let us know. Another question is, can seeds be planted a day or two after drying? It all depends on the type of seed very open in question there are some seeds in which yeah if it's dry then you can go ahead and plant the next day uh, we've seen in some situations where um, melons begin to the seeds begin to germinate inside of the melon uh, butternut squash spaghetti squash that type of thing so it really depends on the particular type of seed some needs to go through cold cycles some needs to go through cold and warm cycles in order to germinate so it really Depends on the type of variety in which you're trying to to uh, regrow. Okay. Uh, also, let's see. In summer of 2019, my squash became covered with a white dust substance, kind of like mold. How can I prevent whatever this substance is this year uh, beforehand, so I don't have to figure out what to do afterwards? So it sounds like that was powdery mildew, and this happens a lot with squash and other viney crops. Um, typically typically squash or melons. And what happens is it's a result of warmer temperatures and moist daytime climate. And then also during the evening, it's not getting as, as dry, still staying warm. It causes those plants to have this mildew occur. It's very common. So one thing you want to do is you want to make sure you're properly spacing the plants, especially this year, make sure you properly space those plants. If you start to see that mildew form, you want to eradicate it. You can remove up to 25% of the foliage from that plant. You can also find a number of things to to use to kind of break up that foliage or break up that mildew. We've used anything from milk mixed with water, vinegar mixed with water, baking soda mixed with water. This helps Break up that mildew. And you're you're disrupting the pH level on that on that yeah. leaf is what you're doing so with the, what the happened, acidity or the 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 vinegar and the milk. Right. So yeah. the powdery mildew isn't harmful to you, and it's really not harmful to the plant necessarily. But what happens is that it blocks the leaves. It grows on leaves, and then it blocks the leaves from absorbing the sunlight to um, chokes so, them out. Yeah, it chokes them out, so they cannot photosynthesize. So if you go online and search powdery mildew remedies, you'll find a whole bunch of them. But that is what it was. Okay, here's a question about canning for you, Holly. Holly is a multi-award winning Wisconsin State Fair canner. I have a question, a uh, simple question about canning. I, uh, let's see, and, and I can't find a good answer. Hope you can help me. If I have a recipe for refrigerator pickles, can I do the canning method with a hot bath canner pickling the product for the same time length as I did the refrigerator pickles. No. Interchanging. So, she's wanting to interchange the, the right. refrigerator. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, basically she wants to know if she can use her refrigerator pickle method for a hot bath, hot water bath canner. Um, no. So there's – so you want to keep the method with the method. So if you have a refrigerator pickle method, you want to leave it at that. If, if you have a water bath canning method, you want to leave it at that. There's different um, pH, acidity – Sugars added to help it preserve, things like that. So that's how that works. Uh, it's not safe to interchange any recipe for another recipe. And in the gardening world, or in the canning world, Holly, you can't substitute one product for another product because you're out of one because it disrupts that whole science behind the canning method in which right, we're contesting. Canning, canning is a science. And if you're going to get into canning, you definitely want to follow the recipe, follow the directions. Be safe. No shortcuts. No shortcuts. Okay, so another question is, I started winter squash. They're going great. They're getting huge buds. Um, they're over 12 inches, but it's it's too soon to put them out. They have these buds. I'm assuming I should pinch the buds off so they survive 
transplant better? Should I also cut back the vines? Uh, you can cut those buds off. Um, it, it was, it would be best if you just started them in the ground at the right time, but since you're at this position, you can cut some of that vine off. It shouldn't disrupt or hurt the plant too much, but definitely cut the flower buds off on the plant and you will be okay with that so it doesn't put energy towards flowering. It is going to stimulate and put more energy towards the growth of the plant. But if you're going to trim, um, experiment because I was not able to find a whole lot of research on this particular question, which is, um, uh, you know, not good. But with when we're trimming plants outside, we don't trim more than 25% or even a third of the overall plant size. It's kind of the, the rule of thumb. So uh, hopefully that helps. Um, and next year, maybe look at not starting them indoors, but direct sowing them uh, at the pro- appropriate time because that jump start is not really jumps. You're not really getting that big of a jump start because you've got to maintain them, harden them off, take them outside, transition them, the whole thing. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this program or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can do that by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. Or, we'll make it easy, send an email, and you know the address, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to the copy of this show. Tell your friends and tell your family that this program is on the air. That's how our program is spread by word of mouth. Also, you can find it on podcast on all previous shows. Join us next week on the program when we're going to talk about the four biggest garden myths on the Internet and growing berry bushes, plus a very well-known YouTuber. His, he is the host of the James Prigioni YouTube channel. Dan will be with us, and we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.